This is the online edition of The Big Question. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Hussein Mohammed. We begin with some sad news. One person was shot dead and score others uh, nursing injuries as the protest by farmers in Nyandarua over the Kinangop wind project entered the second day. The man is alleged to have been shot by police when he and other protesters stormed Magumu police station. Day two of protest in Kinangop and this time round the residents stormed Magumo police station to make their voices heard as they demanded the immediate release of their colleagues who had been arrested during Monday's protest forcing the law enforcers to open fire. Tragedy struck when one of the protesters was shot dead, allegedly by officers who were trying to stop the demonstrators. The melee left at least four people nursing gunshot wounds while others sustained injuries as they scampered for safety. The demos were later taken to the streets where farmers engaged police in running battles along the Magumo Javini Road. Those shot are said to have stormed Magumo police station to rescue some of their colleagues arrested by the police during yesterday's demos. This came as a high-level meeting called to address the OMPAS surrounded the 13 billion shillings project failed to come up with a resolution. Many farmers in the area are unhappy with the entire compensation package offered by the government for their farms and have voiced their strong opposition to the project. Addressing the irate farmers, Energy PS Joseph Joroge said that the meeting will involve of all area leaders and would be held on Thursday so as to resolve the pending issues, adding that the government could not force the farmers to accept the project. He, however, called on the farmers to maintain law and order. Miradi tulio nao katika nchi hii ni miradi mingi sana. Saa hii tunaire inaito a standard gauge leruwe, tulikuwa na matatizo kidogo kidogo, tumeasuruhisha. Tumekuwa na pro, tuna project inatoka ramu, unasikia kitu unasiki, 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 Nayo inatembea mpaka mpaka mataifa tunaopakana na inaendelea. Kama yenu mtasema haisiendelee basi itakuwa ni, itakuwa ni Locals have accused the investor of taking advantage of some of the residents' advanced years and illiteracy in convincing them to back the project. That turbine is about 80 to 100 meters from the ground level. So it doesn't have any impact on anybody. And it is just using the wheat. The wheat is just the one which is brewing it. It's renewable energy. It is the best form of energy. It doesn't have any emissions. And uh, you know this, this is the, the new way of creating sustainable sources of energy. Yesterday, some farmers blocked the Nairobi Nakuru Highway for over four hours, leading to a massive traffic snarl-up. They vowed that the project would not continue as it posed a threat to the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of farmers who will be living close to the wind turbine. Michael Njenga, Citizen TV. Our British, a British court will on Thursday sentence a 55-year-old man accused of sexually assaulting hundreds of young boys near Gilgil, where he worked on a rescue program for street children. Simon Harris has been found guilty of eight charges of indecent and sexual assault on five homeless boys, one of whom was just nine years old. Harris' sentencing that was scheduled for today in a Birmingham court was scheduled this afternoon. A former school teacher described by police as a prolific and calculating sexual predator uh, had denied luring boys to his home near Gilgil between 2002 and 2013 using food, money and the promise of schooling. Police believe the abuse carried out by Harris could have spanned for four decades and the number uh, of victims could be in the thousands. Parliament today launched a scathing attack on the judiciary accusing judges of applying the law selectively by declaring the Constituency Development Fund invalid. Speaker of the National Assembly, Justin Muturi, led MPs in condemning the High Court ruling last week for what they termed a skewed interpretation of the principle of separation of powers. The MPs are now planning to amend the Constitution to entrench the multi-billion shilling kitty in the country's supreme law. Francis Kashuri tells us more. In the public gallery. The verdict of a three High Court judge bench last Friday declaring the CDF Act unconstitutional has jolted the lawmakers and found its way into the floor of the House. Honorable Speaker, is it in order for us to discuss issues of the county, yet our own business of the CDF is unconstitutional? <laughs> I think we better put this business aside, then we discuss issues that is constitutional for us. 
These others are unconstitutional, Honorable Speaker. In their ruling, Judges Isaac Lenaola Mumbingugi and David Majanja said all devolved funds, including CDF, must be channeled through the county governments and effectively took away the multi billion shillings kitty from the lawmakers. But Parliament now accuses the judiciary of activism and selectively interpreting the Constitution. But it is a fact, we know CDF has been used even to construct law courts. I thought that was more important so that you can, t you can show those others that they have also benefited from CDF. But don't just talk about bursary. You know, sometimes when you have to do certain things, you must also take the fight to some people, isn't it? Most counties of the 47, the governors themselves are misusing the funds. What is working for this country is CDF. It is the only fund working for this country. Now, speak, I saw another governor just stamping. The courts have spoken. So I say, the courts have spoken. The same courts are a creation of this assembly. We fund them. We do everything. So let us speak louder than the courts. At the heart of the Friday ruling is the principle of separation of powers. The judge is observing that members of parliament cannot continue serving as patrons of the CDF kitty in their constituencies while at the same time performing their oversight role, a view Muturi and the lawmakers termed selective. This is a principle of separation of powers. People must be meant to, to know it is not something that must operate like, uh, I mean, in abstract. There are certain things that must be taken on board as a reality. People bring budgets, development budget, to the only one construct, I don't know, courthouses, I don't know, buy what. We, we, that is implementation. That's a, an executive function. Other than planning to head to the Court of Appeal to contest the High Court ruling, members of Parliament are keen on amending the Constitution to help retain control of CDF. CDF is here to stay and we have the powers to make it constitutional. So I think let, let us ready ourselves. This is a game of chess. Whichever way it will be constitutional, Mr. Speaker, you guide us and make sure this thing is constitutional by yesterday. CDF was established in 2003, and so far over 150 billion shillings has been disbursed to the constituencies. Each of the 290 constituencies received between 80 and 150 million shillings annually to initiate development projects. Francis Gashuri for The Big Question, online edition. Just four days after the Ministry of Education issued a new fee structure for public secondary schools, the Ministry and the Kenya National Union of Teachers, NAT, have strongly differed over the guidelines. NAT says it will object to the implementation of the new directive, saying it was a recipe for crisis in the learning sector. A new structure announced by the Education Cabinet Secretary Jacob Kaimeni that capped fees for day secondary schools at 9,374 shillings per year and which set maximum fees for boarding schools at 55,553 shillings per year threatens to degenerate into a storm over the government's new fees policy. The maximum cost of this school is going to be 22,000 444, uh, while that of boarding schools will stand at 66,424. KNUT says implementation of the new fees directive is likely to result in the loss of jobs by hundreds of teachers hired by school boards of governors and subsequently compromise quality of education. And our recommendation was very clear that first, before we think about lowering fees, fix the teacher shortage, because that is the cost. Today, it has not been fixed, and as long as it is not fixed, then the fee you are proposing is a recipe for chaos. While the Education Minister Jacob Kaimeni maintains that the new fees are affordable and that the figures were arrived at after thorough consultations with all the stakeholders, Socion says implementation of the new fees is impracticable. Implementation of proposed sub subsidies are yet to be effected. You know, this is something which will be done later. Eh? So you have to take factor that. 
That is why there is that increase of that 1%. As the two clashed over the directive at Kenyatta University, where Kaimeni gave a public lecture on education reforms in the country, head teachers remained mum on the issue, fearing victimization. Now, candidates who sat for the Kenya Certificate of Secondary Education Examination, KCSC, in 2014 will know the results on Tuesday next week. Education Cabinet Secretary Professor Jacob Kaimeni is expected to release the results at Mtihani House in Nairobi. Over 450,000 candidates sat for the examination last year. Now, a mother of twin albino children aged one uh, is fearing for their safety, alleging her clan members have on several occasions threatened to kill the toddlers who, according to Bukusu tradition, are cursed. Windrow Simuyu from uh, Nairobi's Kawangware estate says her extended family chased her away from her matrimonial home in Kakamega after she clung to the children, refusing to have them killed. The mother of seven uh, says the twins have also been targeted by persons keen on selling them in neighboring Tanzania where albinos are killed and their body parts used in witchcraft rituals. Simiu says numerous trips to the police and the area chief seeking protection for the children have not borne fruit. Mabaya, tunaishi karibu na huu msitu wa Lenana, ambapo hawa watu wakikuja, hata ukisema ya kwamba ujaribu kutoroka na watoto. Unaona ya kwamba wanajaribu njia nyingine, wakupate tena wanakuja wakati ambapo watoto wako peke yao. Sasa inabidi ni kitoka hata kuenda dukani, ni hache mtu kwa nyumba. The High Court's nullification of eight clauses in the controversial security laws has left court and the government floating the next course of action. The court's decision followed a petition filed by the opposition court, which argued that several provisions in the act were unconstitutional. Experts, however, say moving forward, the balance between fighting terror and respecting the rights of Kenyans must be respected, even as the country puts in place measures to enhance security. It is how to strike the delicate balance between overhauling security structures and the law versus infringing on Chapter 4 of the Constitution that protects the Bill of Rights that now becomes of essence. I think this is one thing that should marry us, you know, as political affiliation, as men and women and children of Kenya, and then we find solutions uh, to this thing. So the balance is found again in the Constitution. How do we limit these uh, rights? That's why we say through legislation, and through legislation means Kenyans contributing, talking through their representatives and other bodies, resolving on how best they think in an open and demo democratic uh, state, certain rights can be limited in a way that is not contravening them or burning them outrightly, but is reasonable, uh, is understood by everyone as to why those rights are limited in that way. And everyone has contributed uh, in that in that venture. I think that is that would have been the best way of going about it, and especially on this issue that should not have been divisive in the first place. What is made for conversation is the manner in which the law was passed in December, first by Parliament, and the subsequent assent by President Kenyatta, to which end the opposition court deemed this move as returning the country to dark days. Fortunately, uh, some. As the court has done, it has withheld that latent spirit in certain instances. Uh, in others, I feel uh, probably it would have decided otherwise. Uh, and as you mentioned, especially on the issue of the process of how uh, this law became or was enacted. One, when you think of parliament as a representative body, when you think of the philosophy behind our democracy, it being partly a representative or largely a representative democracy, and parliament being a body that represents Kenyans, Wanainti. If we hold the way that law was passed in parliament to be kosher, to be proper, then we are arguing or we are saying that that actually represents Kenyans. That is how we are, uncivil, violent, uh, you know, and unruly. So I would have thought that in one way of holding our democracy intact, our dignity and our sovereignty, uh, parliament or the National Assembly should have been asked to go and rework on the law and redo the law in a proper way. 
in a way that actually represents wananchi, in a way that represents the dignity, the respect, uh, and the honor and the sovereignty of Kenya. Court had successfully argued that some clauses of the security laws were unconstitutional. Eight such clauses were suspended. Then came yesterday the High Court's decision to declare five out of the eight and another three clauses unconstitutional. It is a host of these clauses that some argue infringe on Chapter 4 on the basic freedoms spelled out in the Constitution. For future misconduct uh, in Parliament. Secondly, um, we have to remember also when we were in the process of crafting the constitution, uh, one of the big issues that did come about uh, was how we were going to have a bill of rights that was progressive, comprehensive, and was a turn away from what we used to have, and especially in the 80s and 90s and 70s, to a brand new Kenya where Kenyans would get on a constitutional path that would seek to enhance their freedoms. And that's why the Bill of Rights is written the way it is. It is crafted the way it is in a very, if I would say, prodigal manner, uh, in a way that is very shy, very, very shy in withholding or limiting the rights that and freedoms that Kenyans have put in the Bill of Rights. And that's why even when you look at the language behind the provision that uh, allows us to limit, we actually come from you know, a prohibitive message that those rights shall not be limited. The three suspended clauses that were not declared illegal, however, are Clause 29, which brings to the fore debate on facts to be used in SU as evidence, Clause 56, that had been suspended after it gave authority to National Intelligence Service Director General to authorize members of the service to obtain information, material, records, a document, or anything in a covert operation, and a Clause 58, which would replace the authority to amend that from the General Parliament to the National Assembly. President Uhuru Kenyatta left the country today for Algiers, Algeria, for a three-day official visit. The president is expected to hold numerous discussions to improve bilateral relations between Kenya and the North African state. The president, who is accompanied by several senior members of his administration, will meet Algerian President Abdul Aziz Bouteflika, Prime Minister Abdul Malik Salal, and the People's National Assembly Speaker Mohamed Larbi Ul Khalifa, among other top officials of the Algerian administration. And finally, the Kenya Premier League has been suspended for two weeks. This follows a high court order barring KPL from staging any matches parallel to the Football Kenya Federation League until a suit filed by FKF is heard and, de and determined. FKF had last Friday moved to court to contest the staging of parallel league matches by the two warring organizations. The Kenya Premier League, the Football uh, Referees Association and Sports Kenya, who own stadiums in Kenya, were named as the defendants. While this is going on, FKF has deregistered the clubs in KPL, including football giants uh, in Kenya, AFC Leopards and Gormahia. And that's all we have for you on the online edition of The Big Question. Thank you for watching. I'm Hussein Mohammed. Have a good night.